Hello and welcome back to All Four Women's Football. The biggest welcome back today, though, has to go to Meg. It is an honour to have you back on the panel here today. It's I'm also sorry. Go for it. You can speak the whole show. I've I've missed everyone dearly, so it's an honour to be back. And I hope everyone appreciates my little backdrop. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I'm also very relieved myself as it no longer means I'm the only Arsenal fan having to contend usually with a few too many United fans. But speaking of rivalries, we will be speaking much more about that and we'll be getting into the nitty gritty and the politics and how it can go too far sometimes in women's football later in the show. So let's get into it. So to start off, to start us off, I'm going to start where I think this idea kind of originated from, which is largely because of the events of the Continent Cup final, which is potentially where rivalry went a little bit too far. And I don't really want to. I want to make sure we signpost that that is not what we see as just a rivalry. Potentially, it can go a little bit further. Um, but first of all, I'll say hello to everyone. So Mia, how are you doing? I'm great, thank you very much. I'm very excited to have you both back. Um, yeah, it's it's great. We've obviously we're missing two people. I can't. There's there's a couple of people missing. I don't know who, but the main the main guys in here, which is all the males. So very excited. And um, Meg, we obviously heard from you a little bit, but how are you doing? Looking forward to it. Yes, yeah, I'm all right. Thank you. Yeah, very much looking forward to chatting about women's football again. <laughs> Excellent. Last but not least, Barry, how are we? Apparently unable to mute, uh, which isn't good for a professional of the show, is it really? Uh, it just happens every now and again. Something just pops up in the corner and you're like, what's that all about? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm absolutely fine, apart from my inability to work technology. All is well. Um, I've missed the fact there's been no Wolf United show today, so that's been a bit weird. Uh, not having to worry about anything like that. And, of course, we've got the international break, which isn't my favourite time of the year. But it's been good. So, yeah, very much looking forward to getting our teeth into quite a meaty topic, really. Yeah, absolutely. Plenty of beef in there. Um, but I think we'll start with the, the incident. So to give a little overview for those who... I don't think anyone will have been able to miss it. But for those who did, obviously, there was a bit of... Shenanigans, shall we say, at the end of the Continental Cup final, Arsenal won in extra time. Um, and there was a, a little bit of contention on the sidelines. I think Jonas Eidebol in a bit of a shouting match with Erin Cuthbert, whether he'd originally directed that at the fourth official or not. Emma Hayes clearly unhappy with our half time, uh, full time, sorry, and um, gave him a little shove instead of a handshake. Me, I was starting with you, just like, have I missed anything? And what were your like initial reactions to the kind of when you first saw that? Um, yeah, I mean, I saw the, I saw what Emma Hayes did before I saw the first incident. So that was all I had to go off originally. Um, and I thought it's really hard because obviously her side had just lost a cup final. So you're factoring in the fact that she's just lost a game and then whatever's happened on the side that we don't know what's been said. We don't, we don't know what's been said. Um, it's not f for someone as professional as Emma Hayes and someone that prides herself on being professional in the way that she talks, in the way that she addresses things. Um, it was a bit of a shock. Um, very uncalled for and someone of her standards and her professional level should be doing better than that in in you know if you've got a problem you raise it to the fourth official that's what they're there for and and then you make you take the, the steps further and further if if, if needs be post-match but to do that when there's a camera in the way too in you know national tv it's not a good look and um she should know to do better than that 
Yeah, of course. And we obviously will go into more what was said, I guess, in the press conferences afterwards. Um, obviously, she didn't step down from that and called it male aggression um, and was potentially there. But Meg, your initial reaction, I guess there was a lot going out on Twitter. There was a lot in the in the aftermath of that game, talking potentially less about the game, more about the incident. What did you make of it all? Yeah, I mean, I was looking on Twitter sort of as soon as it happened, really. And there was, it was kind of two-sided that obviously a lot of people were saying, why, why on earth was ha- did Hayes push Ada Val? And then a lot of people were saying, but the way Ada Val treated Erin Cuthbert. And I, at the time, I couldn't remember what had happened at that point until I saw a video. Because someone had said to me that Ada Val had squared up to Cuthbert. And I was like, did he? Like, I can't remember seeing that. And so when I looked back at the video and it was Cuthbert that actually sort of walked in the direct, I say, like, walked in the direction of Ada Val. Ada Val didn't actually really come out of his area obviously yeah we don't know what was said maybe Adeval shouted something that he shouldn't have done but yeah I think when Emma Hayes says male aggression you, you, I don't know it's just f- from what you see you shouldn't be saying that especially after you shoved him or whatever and yeah I think it's a shame that that was probably the overarching sort of story that came out of the game. And obviously we know what happened to Frieda Marnham during that game. And I hate to say it, but it felt like it kind of overshadowed that situation, which obviously I'm an Arsenal fan and it was it was one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever seen when Frieda Marnham was on the floor for so long. And it felt like that story was not as, you know, obviously you don't want to blow it into proportion, but it was so serious that, that should have kind of taken the limelight in a sense. And it and it didn't because of what happened on the touchline. Yeah, absolutely. We could have been maybe having like a conversation about how heart health. I'd listened to the the podcast uh Rika Savecki had done before, and she's obviously had to step down from football um as a result of heart health. And she was kind of saying that in England she hadn't had the tests and it wasn't funded in the women's game to actually expose that. So we could have had, been having more serious conversations. Instead, we're having this conversation, um, which has become important. I think these conversations need to be had, but like you said, maybe not in that in that context. Barry, what was your kind of um, reflections on the game now, potentially bringing in a little bit of the, the press conference? Obviously, we've spoken about not being usual like Emma Hayes. I thought it was quite ironic that she kind of mentioned how she'd never got a yellow card, but everyone had kind of just seen those actions. What did you make of the whole situation? I was a busy little boy that day, and um, so as a result, I didn't actually get to tune into the Conti Cup until um, literally just before Frida Marnham collapsed. And like you say, that was just a huge moment, really, that was horrible. We've seen it a few times in football now, um, and it's never positive in any way, shape, form, or fashion. So that was horrific. So I was actually gobsmacked when I saw the the handshake and, and Emma Hayes was getting all, all shirty. And I was worried about that. So I thought, well, why why she behave like that? So instantly that gave me a negative connotation towards how she was behaving. And I thought, you know, that's just not very becoming of someone who I respect like massively within this game because she is just unreal at what she's achieved. Um, and then I heard about the the squaring up. So at this point, I felt like I should probably rewind and sort of see what's going on. And so I got to the point where they were talking about it and watched the the Erin Cuthbert squaring up. Uh, and it absolutely is Erin Cuthbert that goes to Jonas Idemel. Let's be absolutely clear on that. So that led to two different things. Number one, what did he say? Now, let's be clear. He has got form for being gobby. He absolutely does. I can distinctly remember seeing with my own two beady eyes uh, him screaming at Martha Thomas, coming on the pitch to do so during the middle of, funnily enough, another Conti Cup game. Maybe it's just a Conti Cup. Maybe he should just not be allowed to go near Conti Cup matches and he might be all right. Um, but he did. He properly screamed at Martha Thomas to the point where a couple of our players that sort of jump in the middle and, you know, sort of stood up for, uh, for Martha. And... I thought that was really interesting because that was what I was expecting to see when I looked at the Cuthbert incident. Uh, And it's not. What I see is a manager 
who shouts at the bench because when that happens, you're going to get interactions between the bench. That's football. Benches interact every minute of every single game, um, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. That's why the fourth official is there. And then we see him say something to Cuthbert. We see Cuthbert walk towards him in the menacing, aggressive manner. He stays where he is. And then we see it, it all stops. And I think... The, the, it's where you get to that big question that the term male aggression to be used wasn't helpful at this point and more importantly i think it was wrong it was 100 percent the wrong choice of words um was he talking aggressively absolutely shouting and i think this is we hear it sometimes with mark skinner as well i think sometimes when you see a man shouting in the women's game it just comes across as if the person is being aggressive because they're shouting but the football pitch is huge, but you've got to shout to be heard across a pitch. Um, it, there's a crowd of people cheering and shouting and doing all that sort of stuff. You need your voice to be heard above everybody else, and you're only going to achieve that by shouting. So it's interesting because when it's a man who does it, it will come across as being aggressive as opposed to just being a way to communicate. Whereas if Emma Hayston on the side and does the same thing and shouts, it's not female aggression. She's just trying to get in touch. So... I don't know. This is where the conversation, I think, splits away from sort of where it is. But I think, yeah, Emma Hayes was wrong to, to label it like she did. Uh, and I think the way she chose to behave was just wrong. She shouldn't have done it that way. There's lots of talk about what would happen if it was the other way around. And I think rightly, you know, you would have been absolutely had the book thrown it in because you just can't do that. You know, that's socially, morally, ethically wrong in every single part of the world and it should be i equally think though that emma hay shouldn't have done that to him it just showed bad you know a lack of sportsmanship or sportswomanship and uh, shouldn't have happened yeah I, I think i think it's a really interesting issue like i was quite torn on it at the time i think personally because i think there was like this element of oh but if it was in the premier league and it was two male managers doing it to each other no one would kind of bat an eyelid in terms of the like the shove it's kind of like that's what happens but then you've got this other side of it where she then instead of kind of going into the press conference and stepping down and just saying you know what sorry and I, I don't think anyone I think everyone just have moved on at that point she then kind of takes it up a gear and, and throws out this accusation of male aggression just to take it back to kind of the incident between Idaval and Cuthbert for context I think that originated out of was there going to be a one ball system in use or a multi-ball system in use and um Arsenal wanted a multi-ball system, so could use multiple balls throughout the game. Chelsea had wanted a one-ball system um, throughout the game. And then when Arsenal won 0 up, Chelsea decided they want a multi-ball system so they could take a throw in quicker. That's what Jonas Eidebal has said that the discussion was about. Mir, in terms of the kind of taking it up a level to the male aggression and then maybe moving into this debate of like, well, in the Premier League, it might be okay because it's between two male managers, but because it's between, like, whether it's male to female or female to male, because there's going to be those differentials in power and it's going to cause those problems, it should just not be allowed. What, like, yeah, what's your take on that and, and the kind of how it further escalated into those debates? Yeah, do you know what? And this might be really controversial and I don't mean it to be bad at all, but um, it feels like a backwards step. And it feels it's really easy for Emma Hayes to use that term male aggression to almost get people on her side because you watch that back and thank God there is footage because, you know, we've seen it in many avenues in the past before where um, there's been accusations made to a, to a man and it's incorrect um, or it's sort of fabricated slightly. And I do feel like her using that is, is sort of a throwaway um it's not true it's 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 not necessarily not true but it's it's a real exaggeration on what really happened um so yeah i do think it's a really easy term and and to, to throw and it it does feel like it's a it's a bit of a calculated move that's how it's come across to me um in terms of the the bottom line is you there's a lot of emotion in football whether you're a man or a woman if you love football there's a hell of a lot of emotion in it there's a hell of a lot of passion that comes with it so 
if you've just lost a cup final, uh, you, your emotions are going to be high. Equally, if you've just won a cup final, your emotions are going to be high. So the, the coming together is is both sides having high emotions. One, one just happens to be a man, one just happens to be a woman. If there's two men in a Premier League stadium who would go for each other like that too, you'd expect someone to pull them apart and they'd, you know, the, the same thing happens. Like it, just one is a man and one's a woman. Like Emma Hayes shouldn't have done it. If you are in a Premier League stadium that happens, generally speaking, you either get a red card there and then or you get fined by the FA. The fact that that, that hasn't happened is also, I'm sure we're going to touch on it as well, the fact that she, she wasn't fined. But um, that to me feels like a, a bad decision that sh- shouldn't be encouraged. I'm not sure I answered your question, but <laughs> hopefully. No, it's brilliant. Um, yeah, I'm just we're just getting some like quite interesting comments um, in the chat that I think have a good taste on it. Sean saying it's like what Ian Wright said to label that male aggression tag on him when there's footage similar to what Mia said. Um, really interesting points. And then Sean again saying you look at Tuco Conte, Wenger Mourinho. It does once those things do escalate, you do start to get these kind of. Um, comments coming like uh actions penalized in, in some way and then we also have uh trevor Shea, my mouse has just died which is really great um saying Jonas has history so meg i just wanted to touch on this do you think potentially the kind of perception we've seen gareth taylor come out and say call Jonas Ardeval a bully before how like i think there's already potentially some perception of Ardeval. do you think that fed into the debate i guess and and moving forward like if we widen this out to beyond beyond kind of just the conti cup final and we will kind of zoom back in in terms of like repercussion repercussions like how do you think that informed the debate and and does there need does Jonas Idol basically need to be a bit more careful and a bit more measured in how he conducts himself on the touchline yeah i mean obviously as an arsenal fan i watched Arsenal women games week in week out and you know I know that Adabal isn't the the quietest on the touchline if he has something to say he will say it whether he says it to the fourth official to I don't know the bench or you know as Barry says he, he has said it to you know opposition players which isn't the best way to go about things sometimes I think especially obviously as we've said he's kind of you know a male in the women's game so it is going to be looked at as more aggressive in a sense even maybe when it's not and but I think that's maybe why the situation was looked at and some people were saying oh it's got to have been caused by Adaval and what he said to Aaron Cuthbert otherwise Emma Hayes wouldn't have done anything which obviously we don't know what was said to Aaron Cuthbert and we may never know um but you can't just assume that Emma Hayes has done that because of Ada Val. Like, you know, there's Emma Hayes shouldn't have done it regardless. Obviously, yeah, Ada Val, um, I think, I mean, he's been booked previously for, you know, things he's done on the touchline. So people sort of expect how he's going to sort of act sometimes. And I think he got a yellow card for how he celebrated for the goal that we scored because he stepped onto the pitch or something. So people know what he's like, but... It, it, yeah, it's hard because it shouldn't overshadow, you know, what Emma Hayes did and said because ultimately I think, yeah, she shouldn't have shoved him. And yeah, her saying it was male aggression was wrong. But I think, you know, as Gareth Taylor came out and said, Ada Val's a bully. I mean, it's quite a sh- I say bully is a strong word. It is a strong word to call someone a bully. And I think maybe that's the wrong word to use. I think as Mia said, there's so much passion in the game and some managers just show that passion more on the touchline and sometimes maybe they do go too far, but sometimes it can't be helped. And I think the whole shouting thing, as we said, like when males are shouting, it it's seemed as more aggressive, but you've got to shout across a pitch, as Barry or Mia said. You know, it's not easy to be heard when you're shouting. Um but now I think obviously Ada Val's, you know, his reputation 
maybe did play a part in terms of, you know, what some people thought, you know, it was, wasn't right for Emma Hayes to do what she did, but people are maybe let, not letting her off, but saying, oh, that's why she, you, you know, she said male aggression because of, you know, Ada Val's, how he's perceived already. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, no, definitely. I think Jess's point here um, speaks quite well to that in terms of, like, yes, there are mistakes in the game, but we then need to take responsibility. And I think that's where the line was maybe crossed in this one. It's like, had she just shoved him and kind of said, yeah, sorry, that was in the mo- heat of the moment. I apologise in the press conference. Everyone will probably have moved on a lot faster. Um, but moving on then, Barry, in terms of the kind of repercussions, got this comment from NT. If Fiona shouted anything offensive or aggressive toward anyone, isn't it the fourth official's responsibility to handle that? Um, just your thoughts on kind of officiating how whether that should have been handled and then kind of that Emma Hayes not receiving any punishment afterwards from the FA. Well, I mean, this is exactly it, isn't it? Um, he's, he's spot on, is NT. It's absolutely the fourth official job to do that. I mean, how many times have we seen something go on in the technical area, the fourth official calls over the referee, grasses him up, tells him what's going on, uh, and then the referee sends him off uh, because of what the fourth official said. So if he had said anything that was ridiculously outrageous, one, one of two things has happened. Either the fourth official has gone and not done their job properly, uh, and have basically just gone, yeah, that's fine, and therefore lit the fire, which has annoyed Emma Hayes to the point of, well, that should have been dealt with and it hasn't been, so it's boiled over, in which case the officiating does require looking at, because that would be wrong. Or he hasn't said anything bad at all, um, and Emma Hayes has just had you know, a bit of annoyance, and as we say, lots of things have, have boiled up in a game that is very emotional, and it is. I think what Jess said was spot on about the owning it bit, because even if she'd have said, you know, look, I don't like the way that Jonas has acted today, but equally what I did wasn't right. That's not the way I should have reacted. I did the wrong thing there and I shouldn't have done that. But ultimately my point stands, I think people would take it a lot better. But the fact that she just straight up doubled down on it, you know, it <laughs> doesn't help when you're trying to make a serious point. Um, you've got to recognise your own failings and flaws. And I think, when you talk about the retrospective action and that sort of thing. See, the mad thing is, is that I watched it and it's not much really. Yes, it's a little push, but she's not landed a right hook on him. You know, none of that's happened. She's just basically gone into him. She shook his hand. So she's done the sportsman-like thing, first of all. Then she's just sort of given him a barge, sort of like, you know, yeah, you're a bit of an idiot, Mr. Jonas, or words to that effect. And in fairness to him, he's just gone, well, whatever, you lost, see you later. Uh, and off he goes. And that's, again, it's the way it should be. If they were then stood there having a blazing row with Jonas, showing some male aggression, by the way, and shouting, you can't talk to me like that, and all that sort of jazz, I think we're having a different conversation. The thing is, is that what happens now is everybody goes around, what about her? What about if it was the other way around? And at that point, that's going to be seen almost like it's uh, an assault, like something terrible has happened. And it would be viewed that way. It absolutely would. If Jonas Idaval had done exactly the same, if it was the other way around, if we'd, I mean, Jess is quite good at AI, maybe we could get her to do it. But if we literally had an AI of Jonas doing that to Emma Hayes, the, the reaction would be wild because it would be seen as, as man v woman. And I think... I have to, at this point, evoke the name of someone who I don't really like to talk about because I think he's just like the worst man on the planet when it comes to having any anything to do with football. But I won't even mention his name, but you all know who I'm talking about. When he talks about men just staying in the men's game and women just staying in the women's game. Uh, and for me, this is why, and this will seem ironic because I've probably spoken all in all for about eight minutes on the whole thing. But this is where your voices, I think, are more important than anything I've got to say, because it is the women's game. I just think it's football. And I think gender is brought up so much all the time. You wouldn't get this in the men's game. The women's game does this. The women's game isn't very good. It's all Sunday league level. It's, it's ridiculous. Like the way gender gets brought into it is absolutely mad. You're either a good journalist or you're not. You're either a good footballer or you're not. It's got nothing to do with whether you're a boy, a girl, man, woman, alien, child. It's irrelevant. Like, 
you know, he's got kids, this person. And he's talking about, oh, I couldn't watch a women's game. It's absolutely terrible. It's being forced down our throat. It's not. You've got 999 other channels to go and watch. Just switch that one over. You know, if somebody's coming in, tying you up and putting it on in front of your face, that's forcing you to watch it. You know, forcing your eyelids open with matchsticks. That's forcing you. You've got choice. What you're choosing to do is just to moan. And that's fine. You've got a right to do that. When you do that, though, it causes this division. And I think that's the problem that we've got, is that there is a division that's being sown within the game that's not helpful. Um, it's not male aggression, it's aggression. It might come across aggressive. How you come across is important. Of course it is. But we're talking about how you get across an aggression within a football game. Um, I can recall, and I won't get the names because I, I'm just not, there's too many people to remember. I just about remember your names. Um, but there was the, the woman who punched someone else from West Ham, straight up punched her. She didn't muck about. You know, it was almost like it was watching Nigel Ben and Chris Eubank all over again. She tried to knock her on her backside. Katie McCabe, possibly one of the most aggressive players you might see. And it's laughed about. This is two women. But it's just, oh, look at that. He's just hit her on. She's just hit him on the head. There you go. Look at that. Brilliant, Sean. On the side. I knew I loved that guy for a reason. Um, like, you know, she literally smashes someone over the head with a football. Oh, isn't that funny? Good old Katie. Oh, she's a barrel of laughs. But again... Why is that aggression all right if it's two women to each other? Um, we've seen people stamping. I can't remember who it was. I think it was a Spurs player. Um, they got none for stamping. Lauren James, you know, the abuse she got for stepping on someone. Um, this is all girl on girl aggression. It's women being the aggressive people. Aggression happens in football because you have different personalities. Um, so for me, yeah, I, I would I would throw that out to you guys and sort of say, how do you see it? How do you see the way that Jonas has behaved because because Megan's just spoken about it and she's not sitting there going, oh, he's really aggressive, he's terrible, he's this, he's that. At the end of the day, women are starting to get their voices. They are. You can't go in there and be traditional male, shouty, horrible person because it's getting called out now, as it should be. Uh, doesn't mean it doesn't still go on. But, yeah, I, I think that's where the big issue lies. you just got to stop taking the word male and female, out in out, take it out of the game. It's just football. And, you know, some things are acceptable and some things aren't. So that's where I am with it. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think it's, I think that's what made it so kind of dangerous from Emma Hayes that it was like, it, like you said, it's a step backwards. I think what is potentially an interesting one in the kind of aggression debate, which I'd like to throw into the kind of question you were throwing back to us, is that kind of like across football, and I think, in the women's game, it's potentially more um, pertinent at the moment because officials aren't paid as much um, to kind of deal with it and put up with it. Should there be, like, are we are we happy? Like, because kind of to answer your question, I don't feel complete. like, I don't feel like it's like this male aggression, intimidating thing from you on his side of I feel like it's part of the game. So kind of throwing that back out to Mia and Meg, is, th is that a kind of a shared by you guys? But then also, do we want to step down this aggression? Because that's not fair on, like, should that be acceptable in the game? Or, or does is that part of the game? Or should we kind of be expecting more from the players who are professionals and not to be given that kind of grief to officials? Um, Mia, if you want to start. Yeah, so to answer the first part of your question, I personally can't see any aggression i can't see any aggression i know jonas throws his arms up and whatever i the aggression clearly is in whatever he said and i don't know what he said so i can't you know i can't comment on how aggressive he was because i didn't hear it i don't know what he said um so that makes it really tough the, the aggressive person in the in the that I have seen through footage was Emma Hayes. That's what I have seen. Physically aggressive. Um, yeah, with with fourth officials, I feel like, you know, we've all seen that video. If you've not seen that video, go and watch it and then come back because Jonas stands in the top corner of his box exactly where you'd expect the fourth official to be standing. So whatever he shouted should be heard by the fourth official if they've deemed it fine they've they you know the fourth official has pretty much yeah, they've got a couple of jobs but a big job of theirs is to hear what's going on next to them they're in the middle of the two coaches for a reason 
if they've deemed it fine, they've deemed it fine. Now, again, aggression and, you know, words and whatever is very subjective. Some people find stuff offensive, others don't. Aaron Cuthbert clearly found something offensive that the fourth official didn't. That's really hard to then navigate to say, well, Aaron Cuthbert thinks he was aggressive. So that should be aggressive for the fourth official whose job it is to make sure that those people aren't on the touchline if they are being aggressive, didn't find it aggressive. Where do you even go? It, that's so hard to then navigate because you, you're having to re- rely on the, the two people. Oh, I don't know. I really don't know. I think it's it's an absolute minefield. Um, And I can't remember the second part of your question, to be honest, Laura. What, what was that? I just like the future like do we want this like I feel like it's just seen as part of the game part of football just the fact that managers shout at and players shout at referees and they're allowed to kind of gather around and obviously the Premier League have kind of clamped down on that a little bit more but it's still there to an extent do we want that to be part of the game is it part of a competitive game or is it like this is still unacceptable and we expect more of our professionals yeah, I mean, I think aggression naturally is part of football. You see it, it's a contact game when you're actually playing it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of passion that goes into football. So naturally, there's going to be the highs, there's going to be the lows. And I don't think football without aggression is football. So that is that has to stay. However, it has to be moderated and it shouldn't be personal because that's when it becomes the problem so yeah it has to remain and um it's it's interesting right because if we see how quickly did that video go around twitter on like a sort of neutral level to see and you you know you get it in the if we're going to compare premier league to you see it in the premier league and that goes crazy and you're like oh these two they had a barney oh you know, it just makes the game a little bit spicier when it's football aggression, when it's football aggression and it's, you know, the passion of the game. I feel like this has to have been. Um, that's where there's the problem. Yeah, sorry. Um, I thought I wasn't muted, but I was. Um, but yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, Meg. Any anything to add on that? Any kind of further points? How do you see, I guess, this kind of aggression and in, in in the game? I completely agree with what Mia's just said. I think football without aggression, as we're sort of terming it, it, it it's not the same. You're always going to have the managers shouting at whether it's their players, opposition players, the benches. Sometimes you know managers shout at fans that are giving grief, but you know, sometimes that is part of the game. And especially with players shouting at referees, I mean, as fans, you know, whether we're watching on the TV or whether we're at the games and we see the referee either not give a foul that was an obvious foul or, you know, give a free kick for something that was not a foul, like, we're, we're probably as frustrated as the players in the situation are and we shout as well. So, you know, we're not, we're not, as fans, we're not, contributing to the aggression but you know we wouldn't be fans without our like explosive moments you know and sort of shouting at the tv when a referee or when var gets something wrong because that is part of football but it would yeah football you know we wouldn't have our it wouldn't be in that as enjoyable without those sort of shouty moments and you know having your banter with you know friends that are maybe rival fans of other teams and you know, that's that's always been the case. But I think one of the things is obviously me, we've had male managers in women's football and it's, it's, you know, it's been normal for a long time. You know, it's quite, I mean, I haven't looked at the WSL and how many managers are women and how many are male. But obviously, I mean, I can't remember if any, any of you saw that I went on that debate, I can't remember how long ago it was now, with that American girl about women managing in the men's game and how she was like god it cannot happen at all but why is it you know 
you know, I'm going to, I was asking her, okay, why is it all right for men to manage in the women's game if it's not all right for women to manage in the men's game? And, you know, it's completely the, the same. It's, you know, it's just part of football. And yeah, I think as long as that aggression doesn't go too far, I think obviously there is a point where, you know, it, it does go too far. And um, what someone put in the comments earlier about two called Conte, which is what I was, uh, which my boyfriend reminded me of, uh, I think it was a couple of seasons ago when Tuchel was in charge of Chelsea and Conte was in charge of Spurs. And I think it was like Conte didn't look Tuchel in the eye or something when they were shaking hands. And so Tuchel like grabbed his hand. And was, but like everyone flooded to them both, like all the players or the backroom staff, all the fourth officials to split them up and, I think they both got fined different different amounts of money, and I think Tuchel got a one match uh, touchline ban. So you know it does ha it does happen in the men's game, and there are repercussions. So when you see, for example, look at that, for example, and you think, obviously, you know, no one it was male on male, and no one was shoved. It was just like a firm, almost handshake, really. And it's like you're not looking me in the eye. Why are you not looking me in the eye? Um, so, you know, to look at the fact that Emma Hayes didn't get anything, I know it was a, you know, it wasn't like a, I'm going to shove you, but it was still a, you know, a shove to think that she didn't get anything for that, you know, is interesting when, you know, there are repercussions when it's man on man. I just wanted to, to jump in just briefly as well, just to listen to what all of you just said is, is brilliant. Um, it's just a few things that it sparked off in my head. Um, it took me back to a poll that, that had actually happened. Um, I can't, again, I can't remember who did it. It's just too many things to remember in the world. I think I'm, I'm just, it's not going to start writing everything down and cataloguing it. But a lot of the people that watch were in the football now um, and the people that get involved in it, both the players, the young players, all that sort of thing, never watch men's football. They weren't interested in it. They're, they're not, you know, I, I think a lot of us come from a, a, a culture for want of a better word where we have watched men's football so we're used to the tribalism and the things like that that come around um a lot of the people that are watching it now don't that's where the family friendly atmosphere came in from and all those sorts of things you know you're almost weaning them into it um just like you're not expecting a baby to be born and then be able to walk out and, and buy the groceries and know how to use tapping of the card and all that sort of thing you know <laughs> you've kind of got to get them used to what the big wide world is really like um and i think sean made a perfect point of this being a tipping point as to how the game <clears throat> is going to be seen as to whether or not you know what does it want to be and what doesn't it want to be because we don't have to have two games that are absolutely ideal and in fact i, I both um reflect on each other because actually we don't want that like I, I, I've fallen out of love a lot with the men's game. There's just there's too much money in it. It's not about the football anymore. It's about how much money you're gonna get. And if that happens to the women, that's not because I don't want the women to have lots of money. Because again, what's going on with the game? They deserve the share of the spoils that they earn. Absolutely. The problem is, is that the men aren't just earning it now. They're just being given it because Sky's decided to give them a billion pounds or whatever to to stream their matches. So as a result, that billion pounds gets spread out. So that was the first thing. Um, and then popping on from that, you speak about the managers and, and all that sort of thing. And again, I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that people often forget women's game is 50 years behind the men's game. So if women weren't watching the game when men were playing it, if they weren't getting involved, they didn't really care about it. Not all women, obviously, shouldn't need to specify that, but I'd better just in case somebody wants to shout at me. Because um, obviously you three are here, so you were doing it. Um, but the managers had to come from somewhere and if you're wanting to get your players to a higher level you need the people that have been doing the coaching so i would argue how many women were doing the coaching if they also weren't watching so there's only going to be a small number and that needs to grow that's only it's going to take time and the thing is it's exploded thanks to the euro so as a result everybody's expecting it now it can't happen now the, the landscape in 10 years time is going to be massively different. There's going to be a group of children who turned into players that are going to be well, well, well more advanced than we currently are now in terms of the level of training and everything else that's coming. We're not there yet. And I think that's the big thing. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention about it is it almost comes down to that Ricky Gervais thing about who should be offended. 
um i always use it because it's i i don't always agree with a lot of what he's got to say but this one is superb it's the one where he's talking about when he tweets he just tweets out to everybody it's not aimed at anyone it's just what he thinks and it's a bit like when you put uh a, a sign up in the window saying free guitar lessons and then somebody rings you up so I don't want guitar lessons. And you're like, that's great, but it's not for you then, is it? You don't need to ring up and tell me that. Just don't worry about it. Walk on by. And I think this is the thing. We've got a bit of a culture in the world now where it's all about offence. Who has who's been the most offended? Who And actually, sometimes you have to accept that it's the person who has the right to choose whether or not that behaviour was offensive because you're looking at it from the outside. We've just sat there and said we don't know what was said. So... Really, the only people that know what's happened there is Emma Hayes, Erin Cuthbert, Jonas Eideval, the fourth official, and whoever else can actually hear what was being said. Um, and I think what, what should be a sensible way to look at that is to replace people. So what I mean by that, if you take Emma Hayes and swap her with Jonas Eideval, so if Emma Hayes was doing that shouting, would it be seen as a problem? Would it be seen as a drama? And if the answer to that is probably not because it's just a woman and a woman and it's not a drama then it's not a drama. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. My next question would be this. If you swapped Luis Rubiales with another woman and she decides to kiss Jenny Hermoso on the lips, is that acceptable? No, it's not. Because that was using the position in exactly the wrong place. It's power imbalance. When it's a power imbalance, women now, she was felt, in, thank God, she felt emboldened to be able to turn around and go, no, that wasn't acceptable, and called it out. And I know there's going to be a lot of people who don't feel like they can do that. They can't call out the behaviour. That's what we need to work on, the culture inside these clubs so that people can feel okay to step up and say, that's not acceptable. But it's the people that are there and know, not just people that are stood on the outside that have no real clue of what was being said. Um getting themselves all put under the collar, I think. I think that is the perfect way to end that little segment of our show. Very, very well put, as usual. Um, so, yeah, I kind of, I think, really interesting discussions that we've had. I want to move it on potentially to something a bit more broad now and look at rivalries in the game more generally and, and the use they can have in the game. Um, I'm making sure that we're kind of clarifying that this isn't the exemplar of a rivalry and this incident in, in its little microcosm. But if we're expanding this out to Hayes versus Idaval prior to this moment when off pitch, you know, they're very respectful of each other. And we did, but we did see fireworks. We saw Chelsea mocking his knee slide. We saw him knee sliding and having all those big celebrations. And Chelsea versus Arsenal felt like it was more of a thing since Hayes and Idaval have been manager and have had these the black cat comments and all these different things that have just made it a bit more entertaining. So bar, forget about the Conti Cup final, that's not part of this rivalry. Bar that, do we want to see more of this and more of these rivalries and more of these off-pitch kind of clashes going on in the women's game? And do we think that's helpful? Mia, do you want to kick us off on this one? So Barry just touched on the fact that most of us that currently watch, uh, well, the four of us uh, have been watching men's football, right? But we probably started watching women's football or have let that run concurrently um however there's a great portion of people at the minute that are families and young kids and aspiring you know female footballers so selfishly in my and in my opinion as someone who grew up going to west ham um in the peak time of we went in we was in the championship and we had Millwall home and away uh which is a huge huge rivalry so uh London derbies massive no matter who it was it was huge and and you know there was always police horses around and and don't get me wrong that is too far because there was a lot of you know that's ridiculous aggression and hooliganism however the feeling of knowing that you're going to a London derby and there's going to be loads of fans there and you're going to sing and chant about that that fan group and that one player that scores a goal against you every single time you play them, that there's there's nothing better than that. 
for someone who has been brought up in that culture, who's experienced that from the age of 10, that for me is football. So to see this happening is exciting for me because it's like this is this is okay. This is we're actually being competitive. This sort of like flouncy, oh, it's just women's football. It doesn't they kick a ball around and then they go home and then they all take pictures with everyone and every club from every angle takes pictures with every fan is just slowly, slowly dying away. And it's from in my opinion for the better. However, if you're a family who are taking kids and have solely taken your children to women's football with the understanding that for the last couple of years it has been nice and it has been respectful and it has been and as I need to make this actually really clear I don't it always respectful right always always respectful and from what I said um, before never personal aggression ever 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 it's all whatever's said in the stadium whatever's done in the stadium is you know respectful right it's foot it's banter it's all all of that stuff that once you pass the level of like racism or homophobia you know it's the same we have this in in men's football never anymore if you're a young family and you're seeing two managers having a scrap or two players having a scrap or a push about or someone's gone in with high boots and then all of a sudden every, there's a tussle i don't think those families come back and I think they, those families pull their kids out of playing football. I feel like at the minute we're on this really tender line of we want participation to grow. We want people to fill the stadiums. If they're kids, if they're families, that's great because we're inspiring the next generation. But currently we're, all, we're seeing a version of football that is, is monitored and is PG, right? So... You take that away, and you you add a bit more of this aggression that we're seeing that we've all that we've seen for years and years and years that we understand is is natural to football. I think you put a lot of people off, so I feel like there's two two answers there for me. Would love to carry on seeing this because it makes things interesting, and it makes football football and competitive. And oh, we've got we've got Arsenal next week. How many fans are we going to get down there? You know big big occasions in the diary when you when you look at the football schedule and you see that you've got that team on that date you know that you're going to book a hotel because you're going to go down there i don't think that's that's universal at least yeah i i i find it an interesting one because i also think there's an element that kids love about having that rivalry i was sat at the conti cup final and there was a row of like probably about 10 year olds all um 10 year old girls all probably I don't know how many football matches they've been to but there was like a friendship group some of them are Chelsea fans some of them are Arsenal fans and they they were probably the most aggressive people around me like not aggressive but like into the rivalry and it was just funny like they were just shouting like boo every time there was like an Arsenal player like get her off ref or something like that and they were just loving the whole like rivalry and I think that can be an attraction when you like when, as you say, it's like, like it's it's done in the right way. And I think as long as it's done in the right way, um, we've had uh, a couple of comments. If my mouse will work, slow me down today. Um, Sean has said, "Make a way into football a thing, get some atmosphere going." I think we're all probably fully on board with that. And he also said that it, football. I thought this was quite an interesting one. Football's built on rivalries, but it should be team rivalries rather than just individuals. So, Meg, I want to throw this over to you. Obviously, I kind of mentioned the Hayes Idaval thing making Arsenal Chelsea a bigger rivalry. Do you think when Hayes leaves, that will remain as a rivalry because kind of like the two teams both near the top? Obviously, City's in there, United's in there as well. Or do you think that was a more person thing? And do you think that's necessarily a bad thing? Or what? Yeah, what's your take on that? I guess. I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing because obviously we know that the rivalry is pretty much there because of how close the quality is between Arsenal and Chelsea and how it kind of always has been, obviously. Unfortunately, Chelsea have uh, w won the uh, past few uh, WSLs themselves. Obviously, we're, we're, try we're, we're trying to uh, get back there. But obviously, you look at like then the North London derby and 
personally that that has always meant more to me like winning those over games against Chelsea but maybe that's because as Mia said I've grown up as a man as a fan of the men's game and so I've grown up that you've you, you know you hate Tottenham like when we beat Tottenham it's the best thing in the world but I feel like that that is how football should be like as like yes obviously the rivalry is between the teams that are you know top of the table like you know in in the men's game at the minute you know Arsenal against Liverpool or like Arsenal against Man City the other week was seen as such a big game because it was like first against third or however we were at the time but to me it's the rival you know it's the geographical rivalries that will always mean more because you know in the men's game that's how people are brought up and as Mia said like there are families that if they haven't been to men's football, they will kind of come to the women's game, maybe expecting not like a chilled out afternoon, but, you know, more chilled out than maybe if you're going to a men's game. And that's fair enough if you've never sort of been into the men's game. But families that, as as you just said, Laurie, you saw 10 year old girls sort of, you know, giving it large to each other. And obviously, I don't know if they've ever been fans of the men's game, but it it would make sense if they've been brought up as fans of the men's game, because you see kids, these, especially like little, little boys, these age, like at the age of like four or five, you know, being brought up as men's fans and they're giving it large, you know, they're even swearing and stuff, but purely because they've been brought up that passion is everything in the game and, you know, rivalries are everything. And I think as Mia said, we're on sort of that line where it's like, okay, do we let those rivalries really kind of start to take over or do we, or do we let it be that sort of calm atmosphere in games? And I think obviously um, someone in the comments said it should be about, you know, the team rivalries rather than individual players. Obviously we look at, for example, obviously Kate McCabe has said time and time again that she wants the game to be more aggressive. And I mean, maybe she's right. Obviously, a lot of the thing, a lot of the tackles she makes, or a lot of the things that she does, shouldn't you know, shouldn't happen because you know she just lets the passion get the better of herself, or whatever. But in some respects, yes, the game should be more, you know, maybe aggressive or passionate. But I think it should be more, you know, team rivalries rather than coaches or individual players. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to jump in really quickly and say that as Meg was talking, then I was like, oh, my God. Um, perfect. So what in my head, what we've got is essentially two groups of people going to women's football games. You've got the I'm really not trying to make this a segregated thing. So I feel like I need to clarify that now. You have the post Euros fans who are riding this what this new wave of football and this new passion that they've discovered and they're watching women's football for what it is now and you have people who have watched women's football their whole lives or but stem primarily in in men's football because that's generally you you know if you liked football you probably watched the men's before you recognize women's football which makes it really hard because then you have two different types of experiences and have had two different types of experiences of football. So there's always going to be one group who feel like you're doing it wrong or you're doing it differently. So how you merge the two together to make it slightly more competitive and fruity for us who, who you know, want a bit more aggression or but still keeping it like these are professional footballers who are role models and inspirations to these young girls and and boys um is a really interesting dynamic because it is really as obvious as they're new to football this is what their experience of of football is like and that's fine that's fine you know you're into football but there, there are different experiences and then how you how you try and mix that together and make it make everyone happy you can't, but there has to be a way of mixing the two together. Yeah, I had a really interesting chat with someone that was part of the kind of marketing team who kind of instigated Arsenal's big like 
growth and he identified i think they identified essentially like five different groups of fans um it's like the big eventers the new like the new people people that were already kind of interested from men's football and wanted to make their way over and i i thought that was kind of really interesting in how they've kind of catered to all of those um but i think i do think like there's an element i mean you kind of go on tiktok and there's a lot of people on there that are kind of documenting their journey into women's football and i still think there is an element of everyone that wants something competitive and it's like how do you build those rivalries like you say in a kind of way that's going to be as inclusive of them and not as based on history which kind of takes me on to my next point of like local rivalries because i think they're potentially more understandable than any other rivalry and it talks this point of like team rivalries and Barry, I want to throw this over to you. We've had a couple of comments, um, Jess, talking about the City United rivalry, uh, despite the, the unfavourable results to United, uh, and JJ saying something very similar in terms of the, the, the Manchester derby being strong in women's football. Do you see local rivalries being a really big part of the growth of those rivalries in women's football? And where do you see, I guess, rivalries developing the most? Do you see it maybe a performance-based thing with Arsenal, Chelsea, albeit both London, or do you see it more local rivalries? Very interesting question, Nora. Uh, which I shall try and break down as follows. Um, yes would be the short answer, but it comes in a massive caveat. And that massive caveat is yes, but I think lower down the leagues. I think when you start looking at your tier three, four, five, sixes, that's where your local rivalry is happy. I, I, I look at the, the league Stephen and at the moment. Obviously, it's regionalised. So because it's regionalised, you've got a lot of local stuff going on. Now, I say local, you know, there's some games you've got to travel two hours for. That's not local. That's an absolute trek. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, not everything's perfect. But if you were to go over to the traditional rivalries that you've seen on the men's game, you know, Stephen and Luton have a massive rivalry. But actually, I would argue there's a more of a, a, a rivalry with a little team called Royston, Royston Town, which nobody would really know from the men's game. It's not a slight on Royston. You know, they're just very low down within the pyramid. Um, so it wouldn't be well known. You know, you went and asked an Arsenal fan. Have you, well, let's ask an Arsenal fan. Have you heard of Royston Town before, Laura? Afraid not. There you go, you see. So that's because it's a tiny little place in a tiny little part of Hertfordshire. You know, people hadn't heard of Stephen, so we made it into the, the proper league, really, and, and started playing Newcastle. So the problem you've got with local rivalries feeds into exactly what, what Mia said, which, which fed on to what I was going to go with, which is that you've got different people. The people that are interested in local rivalries are the people that have been watching football prior to getting involved in a women's game. Uh, and I find it quite frustrating because you see people sitting there going, oh, yeah, United against Liverpool, it's a massive game. It is in the men's game. It's absolutely massive. Because but that's not really to do with the proximity. If Liverpool were replaced by, I don't know, Torquay United, then Torquay United would be our biggest rivals because between Man United and Liverpool, they've won the most trophies. It's based on success. It's which team is the biggest team in England. That's the rivalry. It's got nothing to do with just the fact they're stones throw away from us just over the Mersey. You know, it's nothing to do with it, really. So in that respect, that's where the local rivalries would, would struggle. I argue that in the women's game, especially when you get to the top level, it's actually all about success and the types of matches that you have there and the feelings that that creates. Um you know, Chelsea Fulham in the men's game, massive, but there isn't a team really for Fulham in the in, in the women's game at the moment, so it's not going to happen. Uh, me and mentioned Millwall and West Ham. Well, West Ham are there, but Millwall, you know, barely got a side. You know, London City Lionesses would be their side, really, that are the highest up. Millwall doesn't really exist in the manner it should do. Arsenal Spurs, always a big one. And the thing is, is that when you use these local rivalries, United City, Liverpool, Everton, um, Villa Wolves is another one, but obviously Wolves aren't in the... Uh, the WSL yet, but when they finally make their way up towards it, it's got the potential. That's going to potentially draw in some of these other fans. And I thought this was where United specifically really lost the plot in terms of getting people to come to Old Trafford. Is that they're the games you should be putting on. Don't worry about the fact your side might get tonked five or six nil. Get the people in so they can watch it and enjoy the product and do all of those sorts of things because that's how you get the numbers. Um, with the greatest of respect, when you stick Manchester United, uh, 
or Arsenal or City against Bournemouth. It's, it's not got nobody sitting there going, Oh, I must take the kids to go and watch that one as a one off special. Um, because how do you market that? Yes, come and watch Bournemouth, they're a lovely place with a rock. That's it. What else are you going to say about it? It's how do you market that? But when you market United Arsenal, um, you know, Arsenal Spurs, it all of a sudden has a different ring to it to that side. And I think where Mia was talking about, I think the word for me is inclusive. When you look at the difference between the two games, the women's game is inclusive, just naturally. You don't have to try to be part of the women's game. You're just accepted. What's that? You like football? Over you come. And that's it. In the men's game, there's too many stories. I mean, the fact you need to have her game to ambassadors so that a woman can go into a football match and not feel like she's being spoken down to uh, or is going to be touched inappropriately as she tries to walk around the room. It's, it's just not acceptable. Um, but in the women's game, you don't worry about that. Nobody's sitting there feeling like they're being judged. Nobody's feeling like there's a massive drama every time they go to a football match. Um, but it's interesting because it is creeping in. I've looked at a few things that people have mentioned so far. Um, Mexican waves. Lots of people having to go at Mexican waves. Don't like Mexican waves in football. Got to stamp that out. Phone torches. I'll oh, get rid of the phone torches. Don't like that in football. Got to stamp that out. But what about the people that like the phone torches? What about the people that like the Mexican waves? Lots of them must like a Mexican wave. Otherwise, it wouldn't exist. It wouldn't be a Mexican wave. It'd just be a mad person standing up going, whoa. And all and everybody look at what's happened there. Are you all right, mate? Everything okay? Um, it's not the case. It goes around. Lots of people do it. Um, and I think that's the inclusive inclusivity part really matters i would bring in a weigh-ins absolutely they need to be there because that caters for the people that want to go and be with their friends and feel like they can do the rivalry you know the ones that want to chant at each other and have that sort of banter and also crucially not feel like they've got to worry about their language the last count of the number of people that have stood there you know, getting ready to shout something and then they've got to look at, oh, no, there's a seven-year-old over there. I best not say that because the mum is probably going to shout at me and then the dad will have a go at me and all that. Too many people will do that. And then you're having to censor yourself at the football. So that, like, deadens their enjoyment of the game because they don't feel like they can be who they are. Um, you know, obviously, we don't want people that are just in there just effing and blinding all the time and, and making it a, a poor place for people. But it's about people being able to express their feelings. Um, I would have a family stand for those people that want that. And that's why you then temper the chanting. Absolutely sit there and have a conversation. By all means, chant your little hearts away. But you don't have to swear in every single one. I can distinctly remember my first football match at the age of 11 and us all talking about what the referee was. Uh, and I think you all know what the referee was. Um, it was a lovely person. Um and I chanted it, and I've got a clip around the ear from my mum. She's like, you're 11, you can't say that. And I'm like, but they're all saying it. It's like, it's there now. What are you getting all upset for, lady? Leave me alone. Um, I didn't say that, obviously, because I've got another clip around the ear. But, you know, it, it was natural to me. It was, you know, adults do it in front of people all the time. So I would have that. Sit and stand. Not everybody wants to sit. Not everybody wants to stand. So you have seats, you have terraces. That's the whole point. And lots of uh, start places now. You've got a place where you can sit and a place where you can stand. And it's the same thing. If you want to sit, you can. I felt terrible at the game yesterday for United Liverpool because there was this poor little old lady just behind me. And my nephew is six foot four. And every time the ball came down the end, he stood up. And I'm like, <sighs> because she couldn't see. So you just think you paid 60, 70, 80 quid to go and watch a game of football. And all you get is the back of my nephew's head every time something exciting is happening. Um, that's not fair either. So... It, there's lots of things uh, and like I say for me that's what it is it's it's a hundred percent all about that inclusivity you know the men's game's got a long way to go but I think where the women's team and the women's football game goes with this is about just allowing that inclusivity for absolutely everybody to feel like they're represented um, let's not forget it was the women's game that was wearing the rainbow armband long before the men tried to do it you know the you don't need to try in women's football. It's there. It's there. Like, there's the, all the chat in the men's game. When is somebody going to come out in the men's game? When are they going to feel like they can do it? People don't come out in the women's game because nobody's talking about it. It doesn't matter. 
Are they going out with a girl? Are they going out with a boy? Who cares? I mean, it's what's the football. It's exactly the same way as I feel about the blokes. I couldn't care less who they wrote. It's not Love Island. You know, it's FIFA. It's football. So, yeah, that's where I would go with it. So, is there a place for local rivalries? Yes. Lower down in the, uh, in the, in the leagues. That's where that will grow. Uh, again, in 10 years' time, it'll be a massive difference. But in the WSL, it's all about what you've won. And that's why the big matches at Arsenal, City and Chelsea... Um, with Man United thrown in there now. The United-Liverpool one will grow because Liverpool are trying to batter us into fourth now. So that's that's getting there. That needle's there. But when they were sitting there in 12, I didn't care. United-Liverpool, it's just another three points, isn't it? This season, not the case because they did really well. So, um, yeah, just get Karen to give us a call. Sean. I'm available. I'll pop down for half hour. Help out if she needs it. Can I quickly add on to what Barry was just saying about uh, the rivalries lower down? Obviously, when I um, did my stuff with Wolves women, it was always, you know, the rival of, the rivalries were there when we played the top of the leagues like Nottingham Forest, the Burnleys. But it was always the Black Country Derby against West Brom or like uh, the other night they played Stourbridge, who were local rivals as well. And it was, you know, they make the big deals out of those. And yet, Wolves women have all, I think they've won like the past 10 Black Country Derbs or something because they've been there and West Brom have sort of been here for quite a while. And But that's not about the success. That's purely because it's a Black Country Derby. And I always absolutely loved, you know, being a part of those games because even the Wolves women players that weren't from, you know, Birmingham or Wolverhampton or weren't from the area, they were made to feel and know how much it meant to win those games. And every single player, whether it was, um, you know, Jade Cross, who's been at, at Wolves for so long, or whether it was someone who's just come in last summer, everyone was like, everyone is so passionate. And, and they show on social media as well how passionate every single person across the club is to win those sort of games. And I think... Yeah, it, you know, we see it lower down and I really hope we do start to see it higher up in terms of rather it being success against success, just those local, more, you know, just passionate derbies. I just, I just love it. No, I completely agree. And I really like the way they always put those local derbies. Sorry, Mia. Um, they always put them like on like either Women's Football Weekend or around Easter to sell like I remember I've been to the East Midlands Derby a couple of times, Forest Derby. The fact that they're in the same league, like that is brilliant. And they got so many fans out. Mia, did you want to jump in quickly on, on something? Yeah, I just wanted to touch on what Barry said about inclusivity. Um because I'm gonna really try and word this carefully because I'm aware of what it is. And again, big fan of inclusivity. This is it's generally my brand. So, um, yeah, but I feel like in women's football, it's occasionally um, it, the term inclusivity is unbelievably subjective. And it feels like I feel some people take it um, l like a degree of entitledness. So, for example, Barry, when you said about the swearing, I've made a TikTok about it. I was very, very passionate about it. Um, inclusivity for me is saying, well, I should be able to swear in the stands because that's, you know, I, I can't help myself but swear in the stands. But if I'm sat next to somebody who's against it or who's got a small family, that include to be inclusive to them, I shouldn't swear. And I, and this is the next thing because it's like Sean now and and they are doing a lot more of like uh, away ends. There was a way end at Goodison Park. Liverpool packed that out. It was incredible. Uh, there was a way end for the um, Manchester derby. Again, there's a an away end dedicated away end to uh, for LSV. So if you go to Lee Sports Village, there is an area. The mixing of fans in the stadiums is a little bit weird. Maybe that will soon be funneled into one area. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say on on that that inclusivity is really hard because everyone wants different things. And um, 
it's it's tough it feels like it feels like we're starting a new sport and it's like what are the rules what are rules in the stands the unwritten stuff that you can do and you can't do and stands there and who sits there and it's just funny it's so funny we've never had to think about this for a men's game because we've been brought up knowing what to do because a dad does it or a mum does it or whoever does it sorry that was so off topic I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying, actually, and what you what you said there, and what you touched on again, to me, just comes down to the the 50 years that women just weren't allowed to be footballers, because the the men got all upset and worried about the fact that women were actually doing better than them, and all of a sudden, like, oh god, my ego can't understand this. Um, we must put them back in their place, quick, give them a penny to wear so they can go and make sure my poached eggs on toast is done. You know, that day is gone, thankfully, but it does mean that you are effectively inventing a new sport because you're working out the rules as to how it is you want that place to be. So when I said the fan stand that's what i'm talking about the family stand would be a no swearing zone so you would turn around and if somebody's let out an f-bomb then the steward turns up now you've got family stands in the men's game this isn't something new but they're not very well pleased because people will sit there and just go it's the football love get a grip of yourself what you're doing if you don't like it don't come and they don't care because there's two and a half thousand people there every week anyway so what's three people in the women's game that's going to really damage your attendances if you start taking some of these people out of the equation so if you have that dedicated family stand and they're told if you don't it's in your booking you don't want to hear swearing and you want a nice family atmosphere this is the stand for you make sure who you're here away fans go over there it doesn't matter what you want to be you perhaps have an away fans family section too so that they're not near all those nasty tribalistic fans and yes maybe that does then a lot of segregation but again you don't want home fans in your away end because the minute that happens it goes very wrong you don't really want away fans in the home end because that doesn't work either so i think you're spot on um and you're right, but that's where the inclusivity in this game would matter because there are people that want to swear. There's people like myself that, you know, swear like a trooper off camera, but are quite capable because it's my day job of making sure that I don't let out these these words um, when I don't need to. But it's really interesting because being at the men's game yesterday, I didn't even think about it. Didn't even think about it. The ref was called all sorts. But if I'm at a women's game, oh, you silly Billy. <laughs> oh, you're a nightmare. Oh, you're boring. So. Yeah, no, it's a really interesting conversation. Um, and I think as well, it comes down to that social norms of, like, my dad took me to my first non-league game when I was about four and he went there knowing I will hear a swear word, which it's like, it's not a problem, but people go there with that expectation, whereas now people are going to women's game with the expectation that they won't. And so it's more likely you get offended if you hear it even though like I wasn't a four-year-old that then went around swearing suddenly, which I think is the, I think there is a degree of like a moral panic of I'm going to take my kids to a football game and they're going to get like indoctrinated into being a football hooligan. Like, I don't think I became a football hooligan because I heard someone shout at a referee when I was younger. I hope I didn't anyway. That it's being said. Yeah, I can confirm you're a lot worse on the playground. <laughs> and it ain't coming from the football indeed so uh yeah that being said i talking about inclusivity i went to um chelsea versus ajax and i got into an argument with the people in front of me because they turned up at 35 minutes right this is who i'm not inclusive to i love inclusivity but i'm drawing a line here turned up at 35 minutes and they were there was a row of them and they decided to have a conversation stood up like introducing themselves to each other Chelsea are on the attack and I was having having none of it. Um, but yeah, that's where I draw the line, I'm afraid. But I think we've had great chats. The final thing that I wanted to discuss was, and we've had a, a couple of comments on it in terms of just like a bit more perhaps lighthearted, what has been the best rivalry? What's your favourite rivalry in women's football? We can go teams, we can go players, uh, although Sean might not be happy with players. But we or managers, we can have any of those. Um, Trevor Shea has said there's a debate we had about what is the biggest rivalry currently and historically. So opinions on either of them, and also an interesting one that if you want to give your opinion on, go for it. Best rivalries in women's football are country versus country rather than club versus club. And what are they? What are those country versus country? Yeah, just interested to hear anyone's opinion on this. Meg, do you want to kick us off for this one? 
I think, I mean, obviously I might be saying this just because um, I went to Germany, uh, Germany, Australia for the World Cup, but I feel like there's always been, I don't know why, there's always been sort of quite a big rivalry between Sweden and America. Um, and obviously it was really, you know, that Sweden knocking out Amer America out of the uh, World Cup. Like, I mean, to watch that was, I mean, that's obviously because I'm English and we don't like America, but... Um, like to see that happen and to see how passionate the Sweden players, the you know the backroom staff, and just everyone in the ground that was supporting Sweden that day. Like you wouldn't you wouldn't look because you know Sweden are Scandinavian and you have got America who you know they're their own you know continent in, in a sense. So geographically, that's not a rivalry at all, but for some reason it's become this massive rivalry and because obviously America or you know the women's team has I mean they've dominated for god knows how many years and Sweden have always been a very very strong side in the women's game um obviously we we beat them in the Euros and frustratingly drew to them on Friday but I I just like those rivalries that you know th those nation rivalries that are not necessarily geographical obviously you can look at France, Spain, or you know, England, Germany is you know a good example when we beat them in the Euros final. Obviously, that was massive, but yeah, I just like the ones where it's just a bit different, I guess, in a sense. Yeah, no, definitely. There's this comment from JJ as well, and I, I really enjoyed the the World Cup this summer. Um, I think England and Australia played in the netball. They played in the cricket already. And they were kind of tied already. And then it was like England versus Australia in the Women's World Cup. So I did enjoy that kind of cross-sport rivalry as well. Barry, do you have any uh, any favourites for your rivalries? Uh, I'm a bit boring here, but not really favourite ones. Um, I, like I say, I, I like the Arsenal-Chelsea rivalry um, because for me it's fascinating. Arsenal as I was... Not growing up because you know it was not quite at that level um but when i was seeing things that were happening in the women's game it, it was all arsenal as i've got more into the women's game now chelsea are obviously at the moment just dominating everything so i think that's um a big one um from a from a fan's point of view i'm enjoying the man united chelsea one that's that's growing as well i like the fact that we're getting up their noses a little bit and that they, you know, they, they, they're they very arrogant, if that's the right word, in terms of that they're going to be, it comes from the right place. They've smashed us every single time they've played us. So it's not arrogant if you can do it. It's like Prince Nassim Hamid. He was like that, uh, but he backed it up in the ring. So, you know, it's not arrogance if you're just that good. Um, but equally, I feel like that gap has, has slimmed down a bit. So therefore, as a result, I think there was, especially last season in the battle for the title, it was, it was quite something. So, yeah, I like that one. I, I think, like you say, for me, local rivalries will always get there. So Liverpool and Everton, for example, I always look out for that one in the same way that I do Rangers and Celtic. Um, in fact, the Juventus and Inter Milan, uh, we've spoken about right at the very beginning of the show there. You know, those sorts of ones I look for. You know, we, we did lots of work as a prediction league with, with my friends before we brought one out for all for United. And... Those are the sort of games that I would pick, you know, ones that were big. Just like the people that do the predictions league with me, they didn't know anything about women's football. And I knew that just bringing out a whole load of women's football fixtures wasn't going to work for them. So I literally just pulled out the big ones. So all of a sudden you had like, you know, United v City, Arsenal v Spurs. Um, you know, I, I, I once did the Bayern one as well, you know, so just because it was just Bayern, they had the word Bayer Leverkusen and Bayern Munich and those sorts of things. But because they were the women's games, we're like, oh, I don't really know what to do here. I'm like, That's the whole point. It's to add a little bit of jeopardy to it. But before you know it, they then start looking at some of them and they got into the Euros and they wanted to do a women's Euros one as well. And so, you know, for me, I, I think that's where it can sort of carry across. But do I have favourite ones? Um, no. Not really. The Liverpool Man United one, as Emily just said, there is always going to be one um, because it is just massive. But uh, I'd say the women's game, it just it doesn't carry across for me. I'm much more interested in the rivalries that occur on, on the pitch. And the United Arsenal, for example, that's a big one because there's been the beef between, you know, the fact that Leslie Russo made her way over to there and, and Jonas, as I mentioned earlier, with Martha Thomas. So, 
it's those sorts of things really when those incidents happen i think that's what creates the rivalry um so yeah that, that that's my favorite when when uh, when stuff goes down and all of a sudden you've got a reason to hate them other than just oh yes well you live there um the international one i find weird um like england germany was massive in the euros but should it really have been are england and germany comparable in football in senses uh in the women's game i'm not sure they were necessarily but yeah you've got to love it ain't you? england germany massive and then when tooney scores even better so yeah, and Mia, any uh, favourites of the of the rivalry world? Yeah, well, Barry's just taken all of mine, so I'm just gonna reiterate real quick. <laughs> no, so my one of my I've got three favourites currently, um, and there's one he hasn't mentioned to be fair, but the first one is <laughs> England Germany because that was the first women's game that I went to in 2014 and it was at Wembley and I remember it being quiet I remember being able to walk down the seats like down the levels uh it's 13 but um that for me I've always just had my eye out for that now because I you know it's a personal one for me that and then obviously to them win the Euros against Germany is huge. And I think from there on now, it's just personally for me, it's one of the big ones. Um, and then the second one was uh, Man United Chelsea, because it feels now like a bogey team, Chelsea for United, because it they feel like they get so close and then they, they really take them to the wire and then they lose. And then you think, oh, next time but next time they're going to do it and then you play the FA Cup final and you think you've done it and then you lose and it's it's always like it's it, but it's that really interesting like they get so close and you keep thinking that they're going to do it and then they don't and then maybe the next yeah so that one for me is interesting it's going to be interesting the, the as the seasons progress um because they're going to be you know in the dub they will both of those teams will be in the the top division of English football for a considerable amount of time so that would be a good one to watch and then finally of course because I've gone the whole episode without speaking about it um Barry said Juve Inter which historically is true and is a is a good rivalry but Barry also said earlier in the in the show about how women's football rivalries at the minute are based on success and based on who is the more successful team so for me a derby that i it's not it's not a derby at all it's not a derby at all a rivalry that i love watching is roma juve because all of a sudden roma have come out of nowhere flying in the champions league have, have stolen the the title off of juve for the first time in five years after juve just slaughtered the league for five seasons and then all of a sudden Juve have taken the back back seat and they've been beaten twice this season by by Roma. And it's like, where has this come where has this switch come from? Um and it feels like it almost shouldn't have happened that quickly, but it has. Uh so in my I, I like in that that Juve are gonna turn it around and they don't, and then Roma go to win it, and it's it's in it's really good. And Roma Juve is this weekend women i've just seen jj's message but this weekend if you're interested in watching it i'm sure it's going to be on the zone because they always play one of roma or juve but that's going to be a really interesting game so that they're, they're my three but the latter are, are, are passionate about of course no i love hearing a bit about the italian football and i'll definitely be keeping an eye out for roma juve i'm just trying to scan through see what, what other ones we've had emily saying uh liverpool man united agreeing with barry there um trebuchet's given us a whole list here um if you can read that wales fan sean england versus the world so a, a classic a classic take from a wales fan i think and then jeff England versus USA because of Alex Morgan, which I don't think anyone can <laughs> necessarily disagree with. Apologies for saying the name out loud. Um, but on that note, 
I have to say a new rivalry that's going is me and Sean. Like he's, he's coming at me here, and I'm not sure I like it. So there's a rivalry. That's my favourite now, Sean and me. Keeping on that one, then. Keeping on that one. Maybe see you in the FA Cup semi-finals next year. Um, we'll we'll end it there on that note. If we're as I try and find the outro, um, once I've done that, we will end it there. But thank you all for commenting and and joining in on the show and giving us your opinions. Hope we've provided you with some insight. Um, and yeah, just keep telling us your favourite rivalries. But we will see you next Monday, I think, and potentially something out in between then. We, we will see. Thank <laughs> you.